Good afternoon and welcome. My name is John Gloa. I am a chosen substitution for the, the usual person that introduces people at these uh, OBSSR lecture series. Uh, and I'm here today to introduce uh, our speaker, who is Dr. Jonathan Schooler. He's a professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of California, San, Santa Barbara. He formerly had academic, held academic positions in the Department of uh, Psychology at the University of British Columbia and the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, he took his BA in Hamilton College uh, earlier and then a PhD at the University of Washington. And uh, since that time, he's held a number of grants from both federal and private uh, uh, foundations to study a number of concepts around cognition, consciousness, and mental processes. I noted with some selfish interest his. Uh, his interest clearly includes mindfulness, uh, an area of research that I oversee here at NIH. So he may be able to help me find a biomarker for uh, some aspects of that. So he sits on a number of editorial and advisory boards, published over 100 papers in respected journals. But it was his citation of media coverage that caught my attention. Um, articles like that in the Washington Post entitled, Too Much Happiness Can Make You Unhappy, or Cosmic Habituation, or The Eureka Hunt. Uh, and the neuroscience, uh, is neuroscience the death of free will? Perhaps inappropriate for this building, but uh, that illustrate that journalists seem to have made, a, made him a center of attention. Uh, in fact, one of the articles, The Truth Wears Off in the, in the New Yorker, uh, and another recent spot in Nature, which I brought along with me if anyone wants to see it, uh, kind of uh, forespoke the uh, topic of this talk. And uh, I'm going to decline to attempt to steal his thunder in, along those lines. Instead, just welcome Jonathan and please uh, t tell us more about the decline effect. Thank you. It's uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here and uh, an honor to, to speak to you. Um, I have to acknowledge at the beginning that I, uh, I, I'm speaking with some uh, trepidation about this because um, for a variety of reasons. One is that uh, it, in some ways the decline effect challenges uh, science and challenges sort of the way we think about science in some rather uh, fundamental ways and one always feels a little uncomfortable challenging uh, the mainstream. And then in addition uh, I'm going to allude to some very uh, controversial uh, research, the kind of research that many of you may be startled to see me even uh, talking about, let alone um, taking so much seriously. Uh, and so uh, for those reasons, I uh, acknowledge the trepidation. But I, I think, and I even considered not talking about some of these lines of research, but I, I do think that um, it's appropriate to at least see them in the context of the larger issue that uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about today. So, uh, with no further ado, let's move on and see what I'm getting at here. So, let me begin uh, with a uh, quote from uh, Coelho, who wrote uh, the very popular book, The Alchemist, who says, Every search begins with beginner's luck and ends with the victor being severely tested. And I have to tell you that this has been my experience uh, in uh, science in a, a whole variety of uh, different context where I start off in a new area and I get some really rather remarkable results uh, which become um, then increasingly difficult to uh, replicate uh, entirely. Uh, usually I see them but they're just not as strong as they were when I first uh, started off. It, it turns out that this experience that I've had personally and I'll, I'll flesh that out uh, more soon uh, has uh, been explored in a variety of different domains and uh, seems to be a ubiquitous aspect of research that initial attempts are associated with a level of success that is hard to replicate. And that's the thesis that I want to uh, explore with you today. Uh, but I, again, as I warned you, uh, it was first, the term was coined and was first identified in the rather controversial area of uh, parapsychology. Uh, Ryan, uh, who uh, famously had a, this parapsychology lab uh, in Duke, uh, was uh, studying a clairvoyant and had absolutely sort of remarkable, statistically significant at some incredible level uh, with this um, individual. And then as he kept running, the effect uh, got smaller. And he uh, coined the term the decline effect. And then uh, Dean Radin, who's a um, 
perhaps one of the uh, best-known parapsychologists, wrote in his book, Entangled Minds, a frequent observation in psi research is that when a new experiment is first conducted, the outcomes are strikingly successful. Then, as others try to replicate, the effect uh, begins to fade. Um, and this basic idea uh, was uh, popularized by a uh, Jonah Lehrer in a, uh, a recent New Yorker article called The Truth Wears Off. And in this, uh, this actually uh, article came from a discussion he had uh, with me in which uh, he was interviewing me about some of my uh, more mainstream research on uh, mind wandering and creativity uh, and I just sort of happened to mention to him that I had this experience of uh, the decline effect and that I'd observed it in a number of different areas and he became interested in this and uh, looked into the areas that I told him about and found indeed that there were striking examples of decline effects and then found it in other areas as well so sort of interesting collaboration between um, science and the media but uh, as a, a consequence of this, uh, the article actually went viral. It was the uh, number one most emailed New Yorker article for uh, several months. I was actually warned uh, before, uh, before Lyra wrote it that if I allowed him to interview me and if I uh, sort of acknowledged some of these uh, concerns that it would do in my career, and, and it still may, uh, but uh, not so far. And in fact, as a consequence uh, of this uh, article, uh, I was invited to, by nature, to write uh, a piece uh, describing uh, the decline effect. So, so far, uh, the, it, I haven't paid the price, but uh, time will tell. Uh, let me uh, tell you some of my personal experiences uh, with uh, the decline effect. And it may be that I'm just uniquely lucky or unlucky. The decline effect is kind of a peculiar mix of luck and, and lack of luck, because you, you hit it first, and then you have a hard time uh, getting it again. But um, my original dissertation was something known as a verbal overshadowing, where uh, it's, it's kind of a fun finding. People witnessed a, a videotape of a bank robbery, and then they attempted to describe it in as much detail as possible. And uh, then they were given a lineup, including a different picture of the uh, perpetrator and uh, several uh, distractors. And what we found, contrary to what you might expect, is that verbal description actually impaired uh, performance quite substantially. And uh, this effect we replicated, it ended up with a six experiment series of replications. And other people replicated it, but it became increasingly difficult to replicate. I have to tell you that, that now I find it very hard to replicate this basic effect that was so easy to get uh, at first. Um, I've experienced this with a host of other uh, paradigms uh, as well. Uh, again, perhaps I'm just uniquely lucky or unlucky. Uh, we've gotten it with not only faces, but also with color. We got a really robust effect that was replicated, but then that was difficult to replicate yet again with music, uh, with maps, uh, and then in related paradigms, such as thinking out loud while solving inside problems uh, that disrupted performance, but that's proven to be difficult to replicate. Implicit learning, when people describe an implicit learning a paradigm, or when people describe an implicit rule that they've learned, that seems to interfere with performance, or at least it did, but now not so much. Uh, analogical retrieval. So I've been haunted by this experience of getting effects, getting them several times, it's not just like once, but then finding it uh, increasingly difficult uh, to replicate. Now, um, I. Um, Here's, again, where I go into the more controversial areas. Uh, I was exposed to and was intrigued by um, some uh, research that Daryl Bem uh, conducted and decided to follow up on that. Uh, so this is um, having to do with this really sort of remarkable claim that uh, the arrow of time might, under some situations, go in the opposite direction. So physicists acknowledge that there is nothing inherent in the laws of physics that preclude the arrow of time going from the future to the past. Uh, Brian Greene, who's a uh, respected uh, physicist, although uh, I doubt very much that he would uh, see, his, see this as supporting the idea of precognition, but nevertheless he says, the laws of physics that have been articulated from Newton through uh, Max Well and Einstein up until today show a complete symmetry between past and future. Nowhere in any of these laws do we find a stipulation that they apply one way in time but not the other. 
even though experience reveals over and over again that there is a, an arrow of, of how events unfold in time, this arrow seems not to be found in the fundamental laws of physics. Not only do no known laws fail to tell us why we see events unfold in only one order, they also tell us that in theory events can unfold in reverse order. And it turns out that there is a, um, uh, an area of research uh, known as a precognition, which is found in a variety of different paradigms that uh, there seems to be some evidence that uh, people can be influenced by events that have not yet taken place. This is a meta-analysis, admittedly, in the uh, Journal of uh, Parapsychology, but uh, nevertheless, it involved uh, quite a few studies, 309 studies, 62 investigators, 2 million individual trials, 50,000 subjects, and found a small but reliable effect size, uh, uh, which would require a file drawer uh, 30% of the studies were significant. Importantly, in this field, they publish um, non-significant non results, and there was no relationship between the quality of study and size of effect. Uh, this study concluded there would have to be 46 unreported uh, studies for each reported study for a file journal to account for it. Uh, now, in a more uh, well-respected journal, or at least formally respected journal, uh, some would argue that it lost some respect as a result of this uh, paper being published, uh, Daryl Bem, a well-respected, or at least formerly well-respected uh, researcher, um, published uh, a, a series of nine studies uh, showing uh, what appeared to be evidence of precognition in a, a variety of uh, different um, paradigms. Uh, for example, uh, in one paradigm, uh, people were exposed to uh, Aroused, had to say how arousing stimuli were, and if the stimulus was going to be presented again in the future, they found it less arousing than if it was not. And this, again, was not just one, but nine uh, different uh, experiments. So based on knowledge of this, we decided to try a, a variation of this paradigm out for ourselves. Uh, we did a uh, implicit priming paradigm uh, in which we... Um, Basically, there's a standard finding in cognitive psychology, which is that if you see an image and then you see it again, the second time you see it, it's more perceptually fluent. You see it uh, more readily the second time. So if that's the case, and if there's something to precognition, then you might expect that if you were to uh, present a um, stimulus and then present it again, that this, if it's going to be presented a second time, that that would actually uh, facilitate its original perception. So in this paradigm, participants viewed a fixation, there was a noise mask, a briefly flashed image, a noise mask again, and then they indicated whether or not they knew what was presented, and then the critical manipulation on some cases, the image was presented again, in other cases not. So it kind of looked like this, fixation point, briefly flashed image, if you know what the image was, uh, press the up arrow, if you don't, press the down arrow, and then um, it's presented again, or same basic paradigm, but there's nothing. And our original result was small, but uh, uh, quite significant, that the prime stimuli, these are stimuli that are primed in the future, uh, were slightly more likely to be identified than the unprimed stimuli. And uh, there were some complications this zone, so we replicated again, cleaning up a few issues. Again, the same basic result. We replicated this experiment uh, something on the order of what is this, about 16 times, and as you can see, this is the uh, decline effect. And you'll notice here, it's not just like we got it and then it went away. What we get is this um, very linear effect, so that it's, um, we get a linear effect, and if you look at the first uh, overall, the uh, first, the entire effect is significant uh, overall, the decline effect at the point 00017. Uh, level, and if we just look at the second half, at experiments 7 through 19, it's still significant, uh, point less than 0.05. So we're getting this uh, rather market linear uh, decline effect. And things like publication bias and that type of thing really don't apply here because these were all run in my lab. Okay, so the conclusions from this is that overall, the overall effect also remains significant, uh, but there was this massive decline effect. Uh, and the early studies had a somewhat smaller n in them, but even when we take that into account, they still have this significant decline effect. So uh, I'm not the only person to observe a decline effects in parapsychology. This is an analysis of um, decline effects over years in uh, dice throwing. So this is people's ability to influence the outcome of dice throws. And as you can see, there's a, a decline effect in that. Uh, here is a decline effect in the Gonsfeld um, effect. The Gonsfeld effect 
is uh, was actually written up also by Daryl Bem in Psychological Bulletin, a respected journal, in which it's basically a form of um, telepathy where one person sees an image and another person uh, tries to uh, figure out what the image is, and it's um, uh, relatively carefully uh, controlled. Uh, but what you see here is, is that the magnitude of that effect declined over time between um, uh, up until 2001. Now, there's a curious thing about um, the decline effect is, so here they did an analysis and they demonstrated the decline effect. And so you can ask the question, well, what would happen, you've now demonstrated decline effect, what happens if you now look to see what happens to the decline effect? Does the decline effect decline? And there's this curious thing where after they found this, there was actually a 2010 article in Psych Bulletin where you see this decline effect, but then in a peculiar sort of way, the decline effect declines and the effect uh, returns. Again, there being an overall uh, significant uh, effect, but the peculiar decline of a decline effect. And again, uh, the same thing in another paradigm of um, telekinesis. So, conclusions from uh, Psy research is that uh, there have been decline effects in a number of different par domains. Uh, after decline effects have been observed in some domains, the longest studied ones have been, in some cases, a return, uh, and this suggests remotely plausibly that this could be a decline and decline effect. Now, if the decline effect were just in my lab uh, and just in parapsychology, I would not expect you uh, to take it uh, very seriously. But as I hope to show you, this is not just limited uh, to me and this sort of esoteric uh, field of science. In fact, it seems to be prevalent in a variety of other domains as well. And so this is the really curious thing. And so when we consider the lesson from uh, parapsychology, one possibility is that there is this artifact in science and that that artifact is entirely what drives uh, what's going on in parapsychology and so you see this decline effect because the decline effect is sort of emblematic of um, artifact but that artifact also permeates mainstream science as I'll uh, hopefully persuade you. The other alternative is that actually parapsychology there's something to it and they picked up on something which is also prevalent in other areas as well and uh, I think it's an open question uh, which one of those possibilities uh, is the case, although I certainly uh, would appreciate that people may have some pretty strong opinions about which one is more likely. Okay, so let's talk about decline effects in conventional science. I want to talk about uh, three different uh, areas where they've, it's been observed, uh, drug treatments, highly cited medical interventions, and biology uh, meta-analyses. So um, this is, uh, I was, uh, my uh, some of you may even know uh, my mother, uh, Nina Schooler, who's uh, worked at NIH uh, f uh, for many, uh, or NIMH for many years, and uh, has been at a number of other institutions, University of Pittsburgh, for example. And I was uh, in her office one day, and I saw this, uh, this, this article which said, you know, why do the effects of uh, antipsychotic drugs decline over time? I had no idea that uh, this was an issue, but this is a, uh, a meta-analysis uh, by, um, uh, a number of different researchers, in, including uh, my mother, Nina Schooler, which basically shows that the uh, efficacy of antipsychotic uh, drugs uh, relative to placebos has uh, declined uh, over uh, time. But uh, this is not uh, the, the only place in which decline effects have been observed. Bob Kaplan, who uh, unfortunately wasn't able uh, to be here uh, today, uh, who's Associate Director uh, in the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, uh, has looked at a number of different uh, types of medical treatments in which he's observed decline effects. This is a decline effect in, provost in provostatin to treat cholesterol. Here's a decline effect in timolol, which is a beta blocker. And here's a decline effect in uh, latanoprost, which is a treatment of uh, glaucoma. But uh, that's not all. Uh, in a, a very influential and, and I think uh, insightful article, uh, Ionitis uh, looked at uh, a, uh, the most highly cited uh, journal, medical journal articles uh, and um, he found that of the 49 highly cited original clinical research studies, 45 claimed that the intervention was effective. Of these, uh, seven were contraindicated by subsequent studies. That means it actually went the opposite way. Uh, seven had found effects that were stronger than those of subsequent studies. Forty-four uh, were replicated and uh, 24 remained largely unchallenged. So, in fact, over 40% of those studies for which a replication was attempted 
were either associated with a declined effect size or were outright contraindicated. So these are the most influential studies, the ones that were considered, you know, sort of the best of the best, or at least the most uh, highly uh, uh, referred to. And nevertheless, you see this rather marked decline effect. But that's not all. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of meta-analyses by Jenyans and uh, Moeller, and they found, uh, they looked at uh, uh, 44 peer-reviewed meta-analyses, and they found that there was a small but significant decline in effect size with the year of publication, and they did find that the first studies had smaller end than later studies, and that could be part of the effect, but either, even when you have uh, that taken into account, that is, even when you take into account the, the effect size or, um, uh, due to uh, size of n, you still see a reduction over time. And uh, this just basically summarizes their data here. So here we see uh, decline effects not only in my lab, not only in uh, parapsychology, but also in a variety of other uh, domains, including drugs such as antipsychotics, cholesterol lowering drugs, beta blockers, treatment of glaucoma, medical interventions, and biology. Uh, and uh, there are also other analyses going on currently. John Krosnick uh, at Stanford has been looking into psychology uh, findings and also finding uh, lots of uh, decline effects in psychology uh, as well. So, what's going on here? Uh, there are a number of possible reasons for the decline effect. And uh, I think that likely when all the dust settles that uh, the conclusion will be that uh, there's it's multiply determined that there's a number of different things uh, that are going on here. So I want to explore uh, some of the uh, different possible effects and again uh, do this uh, open-mindedly. So Ioannidis's argument was that initial studies often have a smaller n uh, and he found that among randomized studies with, that were contraindicated uh, that they uh, were initially stronger effect sizes were smaller than replicated or um, unchallenged uh, studies. So uh, in other words, um, sorry, uh, he found really sort of two different things. One is that the initial studies uh, had a smaller n and that's one possible reason why you get a larger effect size because the uh, the law of large numbers. And then in addition that um, the uh, randomized studies tended to be later on and the non-randomized initially. And so both of those factors could lead to larger effect sizes initially. Um, uh, he also found that non-randomized studies tend to be uh, unreliable, not surprisingly. And five of the six highly indicated, highly cited non-randomized studies have been contraindicated or had found strong effects versus nine of 39 of the randomized. So clearly two factors that could be involved are small n in initial studies and a lack of randomization in uh, initial studies. However, that doesn't seem to explain everything because uh, decline effects have been observed when uh, n is controlled for, as I just mentioned in the uh, Jenyans and, and Miller um, meta-analysis. And also decline effects have been observed in many domains uh, where there have been random assignments. So that alone does not seem to explain the uh, declining effect sizes. Or the, yeah. So what are some other conventional accounts of the decline effect? Well, the most straightforward account is regression to the mean, right? Uh, finding uh, you're going to run a bunch of studies. Uh, sometimes the error variance is going to be in the same direction as the effect size, and when that happens, it's going to exaggerate the effect, and you're more likely uh, to publish it. Uh, if it goes in the opposite direction, you won't get a significant result, and so you won't publish anything at all. And so it makes sense that um, there would be this sort of bias initially uh, for um, studies in which the error variance goes in the same direction as the actual effect size uh, to be published. And this I think is surely part of the story, but it doesn't explain the fact that we see oftentimes this linear uh, decline effect as opposed to just you should, if this were the case, you should get one big result and then it should pretty much fluctuate around the mean from there on. So this linear characteristic of the decline effect is hard to explain by regression to the mean. Another possibility, I think this is a very elegant explanation, is um, what a colleague of mine termed degradation of procedure. And here the idea, Dan Smelik is the one who coined that term. Here the idea is that the effect may depend on the unappreciated importance of arbitrary methodological elements that are not included in replication. So when we run studies, there are all these arbitrary decisions that we have to make. And uh, 
we don't necessarily appreciate that some of these arbitrary decisions may actually be potent. They may actually be part of what drives the effect. Uh, time of day or the particular experiment or the reasoning, a whole host of different things. And these factors may not be included in the methodology and we may not even appreciate them to be important ourselves. So as the study is replicated, these factors that we don't recognize as being important may be increasingly likely to drop out of the experiment and that may uh, contribute to subtle changes which nevertheless are important and lead to a dwindling effect size. And this, I think, is a very elegant explanation. Uh, and it also has this nice part, which it pro provides one way of conceptualizing the linear quality. Because the more uh, time that goes by, the more of these arbitrary decisions are likely to be changed as people don't appreciate them to be important. The one thing that's sort of curious about this explanation is why are we so lucky at first? Why don't we introduce um, things that aren't quite right and as we replicate you might just as well expect that we'd get it better that these they're arbitrary that we do it you know at in the afternoon instead of the morning that should work for us as often as against us so it's not obvious why degradation procedure always works for a decline you'd think that oftentimes these arbitrary things would cancel out and go in the opposite direction and indeed you'd think that as people ran the experiment they'd get the hang of what are really the conditions that maximize the effect and you'd think that would work in the opposite direction uh, another possibility is refinement of procedure, uh, that there may be improved methodologies uh, that remove erroneous sources of positive effects. So you, you know, you, part of your effect is really due to something that really isn't the actual effect size. Uh, and so when you refine your procedure, you get it better, then these um, errant sources of effect uh, disappear. But again, shouldn't methodological refinements also work in the other direction? Shouldn't as people understand effects better, shouldn't that make it easier for them, at least in some situations, to get effects? The fact that um, our understanding would lead it to be harder to get effects so consistently is um, hard to uh, understand um, entirely. Another possibility, and again, I think all of these uh, have merit, is publication bias. Uh, publish studies and um, editors and so on are going to favor uh, positive results and they're quite likely going to favor strong positive results. Um, let me just uh, introduce um, some evidence for this. So uh, Bartow and uh, uh, Rillig did a recent, sorry that says 2002, that should be 2012, uh, did a uh, recent uh, meta-analysis of 386, 30, 3,867 studies uh, including 52 meta-analyses in ecology. And they found that the first papers published in an area reported the strongest effects. But that if the effect, and if the effect was positive, then the earliest publications reported the greatest positive effects. While if the observed effect was negative, the earliest papers reported the greatest negative effects. Importantly, high impact factor journals published the most extreme effects. And effect size was more important than data quality for many of these publications. And the papers reporting strong effects were often of lower data quality than papers reporting much weaker effects. And, and high impact factor journals publish the strongest effects generally in the absence of any correlation with data quality. So basically what you see here is a bias for strong effect sizes. And that bias for strong effect sizes may contribute to the publication bias that may uh, lead to uh, this decline effect. So what are... Um, uh, some other explanations. The last one is one that's really um, picked up some momentum in the last year or so, which is this idea of too many degrees of freedom. The idea here is that when we conduct science, there are a whole lot of opportunities for us to make judgment calls about which uh, dependent measures to report, which uh, covariates to use, and so on. And that because we have so many degrees of freedom, they may contribute to sort of our ability to cherry pick our results. And indeed, there was a recent study that came out in um, uh, psychological science with the catchy title False Positive Psychology by Simons et al. in which they uh, made a case for the dangers of these excessive degrees of freedom. And they did this in two different ways. Uh, one way was uh, to uh, examine five different sources of experimental degrees of freedom, including choosing among dependent variables, uh, st uh, Varying the sample size, so basically peaking, and if uh, the effect is significant, stopping, and if it's not, continuing. Using covariates, reporting a subset of experimental conditions, and then combining these. And then they did a Monte Carlo simulation 
of experiments to see what would happen if you take advantage of all these different um, experimental degrees of freedom. And uh, what they found is that if they, um, let's see, I think I have a table right here. Uh, if you uh, take a look at the P less than 0 0.05 uh, level here, and then you combine all the different experimental degrees of freedom together, their Monte Carlo simulation said there's a 60% chance that you get a false uh, result. So when you take advantage of all the the sort of wiggle room that we have as scientists, there's a real opportunity to introduce uh, false positive results. They also uh, did a very clever study in which they um, exposed um, participants to a um, listening to When I'm 64, uh, and they uh, took advantage of all the different experimental degrees of freedom that they had. And doing that, they were able to show that participants reported a younger age when they were exposed to When I'm 64 relative to a control song. And I think most of us would agree that this is very unlikely that listening to When I'm 64 uh, makes you uh, younger. Well, how did they achieve this? Um, and they did two write-ups, one which is where they took advantage of all the experimental degrees of freedom and the other where they didn't. So this is the write-up where they ignore uh, acknowledging the experimental degrees of freedom. They say, 20 undergraduates drawn from the same pool as study one listen to either When I'm 64 by the Beatles or Kalimba. In an ostensibly unrelated task, they then indicated their birth date and a COVA revealed the predicted effect. People were nearly a year and a half younger after listening to When I'm 64 rather than Kalimba. Wow. But... What they didn't tell you is all this other stuff. So um, here they have uh, the original report. Uh, it was actually 34 undergraduates drawn from the same pool of study. One listened to either When I'm 64 by the Beatles or Kalimba or Hot Potato by the Wiggles. So they left out all these other details. And then in this version here, they show all the things that they left out. So sure, when you only report some of the sample with some of the measures and so on and so forth, you can get significant results. Basically, they took advantage of experimental degrees of freedom. Now, but do people really do this? Uh, sure, maybe this is uh, something that you might do, but people don't actually do this. Well, in fact, in a... Uh, uh, another paper that um, just came out in Psychological Science, uh, John Lowenstein and Prelick did a survey of uh, over 2,000 psychologists about their involvement in questionable research practices using an anonymous elicitation format supplemented by incentives for honest reporting. There were two conditions. Uh, one condition where they received standard instructions, and the other they used this Bayesian truth serum scoring algorithm where they said they would donate a bit to charity if... Um, uh, for their choices, and that the size of the donation would depend on the truthfulness of their responses. And this has been shown in the past to um, be particularly um, sensitive to those areas where people are likely to distort the truth uh, a little bit. And uh, the, it's hard for you to see here um, all the numbers here, but here we have a number of different um, possible activities, such as in a paper, failing to report all of a study's dependent measures. 63% of respondents said that they did that deciding whether to collect uh, more data after uh, seeing whether the results were significant, 55% uh, said they did that. Stopping collected data earlier than planned because one found the result that one had been looking for, uh, nearly a third said they'd done that. So virtually all of the um, degrees of freedom that uh, was identified in the Simons et al. Uh, study turns out that a significant proportion of researchers uh, take advantage of these or at least um, appear to in, from this survey. So, could selective reporting account for decline effect? It certainly could be an important factor. Initial investigators may be especially motivated to use degrees of freedom to obtain the greatest possible effects. No question it's a major problem for the field, but it does not uh, explain uh, my uh, personal uh, experiences. I've watched doing the exact same paradigm, these effects uh, get smaller. And it also is hard to explain see how these things would produce this systematic linear decline effects that have been observed across fields. Okay, uh, here I go a little bit again into the area that I'm hesitant to go, but I, I can't resist um, just uh, putting this out there. So non-conventional accounts of the decline effect. So uh, if you ask Daryl Bem what he thinks is going on, he suggests that experimenter bias influences effects in some non-conventional way. So this is basically parapsychology influencing the experimenter himself. Um, so he, fi he finds that the, those 
re there have been a number of attempts to replicate his paradigm, and those people who believe in his effects have found um, uh, effects, whereas those who tend to be skeptical have found non-effects. And uh, Bem argues that this may be that the actual beliefs of the uh, experimenter is uh, somehow, in a parapsychological way, influencing the outcome of the results. Now, uh, you might think that this is ludicrous. In fact, you probably do. But I asked um, Bob Rosenthal, who is the person who really discovered um, experimenter expectancy effects, uh, what he thought about this um, possible interpretation. And you might be surprised to hear what he said. Keep in mind, for those of you who don't know, Bob Rosenthal is the former chair of the psychology department at Harvard University and uh, a, a, a well-respected uh, individual. He says, Daryl Bem is in good company. Gordon Allpart also believed that interpersonal expectancy effects might well be mediated parapsychologically. As of today, I have no evidence to support that position, nor do I have evidence to support the position that parapsychological phenomena are not involved in the mediation of interpersonal expectancy effects. Over the years, my students and I have found a number of potential mediating variables, but we are a long way from explaining all of the mechanisms that serve to mediate the operation of interpersonal expectancy effects. So. Uh, Rosenthal, who I think is a, a sane person, thinks it's not inappropriate to keep our mind open to the possibility that somehow, in some way that we don't yet understand, uh, the expectations of the um, experimenter may be influencing the outcome of results. Okay, if that is not radical enough for you, I can't resist but going one step further, uh, which is um, that it's possible that somehow the phenomena themselves change as a function of observation. Uh, it's known in other areas that are at least suggested one interpretation of um, effects in quantum mechanics is that scientific observations somehow affect a phenomena. And so I don't think we can entirely rule out, rule out although I don't think we should jump on the bandwagon of this uh, quite yet, that genuine effects may actually fade with repeated observation in some peculiar way that we can't under, yet understand, uh, which would suggest that the laws of nature uh, are not immutable, which again is a very radical view, but one that has also been entertained um, in, by physicists. Admittedly, these are explanations of last resort, but I don't think we can entirely rule them out until we get a better handle on the actual source of the decline effect. Okay, so how can we get a better handle on the um, source of the decline effect? And here's where I think people, even if you totally rule out some of the more radical ideas I've presented here where you may uh, find some sympathies. I think that in order to get a handle on this, we need to have more transparency in science. We need a process to let science, scientists log their hypotheses and methodologies before an experiment and the results afterwards regardless of outcome. Right now, there's this tremendous bias in science where only those uh, findings that have been vetted through this process that is quite biased become available. And I really think, and this is something where I think NIH really uh, could play a role, that the possibility, the time has come for us to think about providing a way where all data, regardless of outcome, is um, ultimately made available and where scientists, before they run experiments, carefully log what they're going to do, what they're planning to do, and so on. So there would be a lot of challenges to such a, a approach. It would require an automated protocol to enable study methods and results to be entered and retrieved. It would require some way to assess the quality of the work. And I think there'd be some opportunities here, too. Perhaps there could be some open access commentaries moderated in a manner similar to Wikipedia. It would require a way uh, to assure the qualifications of researchers who use it. It would require the maintenance of a blackout period to protect hypotheses and findings uh, prior to publication. And it would require incentives and perhaps even new rules from funders uh, to take part. But I think that this is not beyond the ken of imagination. I think this is something that, that could happen and that if the right incentives were put in place and if the you know, carrots and perhaps sticks uh, were, uh, took place, if people felt that this was something that was appropriate to do, that it could be done. And certainly we have the technology uh, to do it. Indeed, uh, Brian uh, Nosick at the University of Virginia has established and is about to um, have enter beta piloting of a, a website that would actually do all of these things. And uh, as uh, Many of you know there is something rather similar already uh, happening for uh, clinical trials uh, that, uh, uh, although uh, not perfect, has gone a long way towards uh, increasing the transparency of, uh, of, of clinical trials. So 
what would the benefits of such an open access repository be? It would reveal how published studies fit into a larger set of conducted studies. And this is, I think, one of the critical things. In understanding the decline effect right now, we just don't know how the published studies relate to all this giant mass of unpublished work. It would overcome many of the problems stemming from excessive degrees of freedom. Regardless of what you think about the decline effect, there's this whole issue of excessive degrees of freedom that needs to be addressed. It would make the scientific process much more transparent. We would have a much clearer understanding of exactly what's going on in science instead of this peculiar way in which we get this, this sort of cherry-picked version of science. It would likely reveal the source of the decline effect. So, the bottom line. The decline effect has haunted me my entire career, and I wonder how many of you uh, have had uh, experiences of a similar sort. It has also been observed in many domains of science. Many factors are likely to contribute to the decline effect. Um, it highlights the likely impact of questionable yet common scientific practices. And we cannot completely understand the decline effect until science does a better job of making available all studies, not just those that have been tailored for publication. And again, this is a point that I, I really think is important. I really think the time has come for us to seriously consider some sort of way of increasing the transparency of science where uh, researchers are uh, expected to make all of their um, protocols and all of their findings uh, available. An open access repository would go a long way both towards correcting excessive scientific degrees of freedom and revealing the sources of the decline effect. Thank you very much. Yes, Alex. Well, I think a lot of the drug studies um, showing decline effects in, in those domains would, would constitute examples uh, of, of that sort. But I do agree uh, that um, my expectation is if you were to look at the, uh, you know, Galileo's, uh, the rate at which, uh, you know, balls have been, you know, going down at a certain rate, you know, uh, probably the same rate uh, ever since that was, that was first observed. So there is some category of um, kinds of experiments that may be uh, particularly uh, vulnerable to a uh, decline effects. And if I were to guess what it was, I would say it's, you know, um, the kind of counterintuitive one. So there's a recent failure to replicate um, some research by, uh, by John Barge on implicit goals. And I've always said that seems like the kind of finding that you're going to have to get exactly right uh, in, in order to observe it. So I, I think your question is a very good one. The drug studies seem to suggest domains that don't seem all that counterintuitive where uh, decline effects have been observed, but I do think it's the sort of surprising counterintuitive results that may be the most vulnerable. Right. Well, and that's, that's, I mean, I've gotten done the exact same paradigm and I found harder times doing exactly the same thing, which is, again, what, make, what makes me suspicious. But I think that this is, that there are a lot of questions that um, are open and that what we really need to do is have very sort of careful analyses uh, in a variety of different domains uh, to see exactly the magnitude of these, these effects. Yes. Well, um, 
it depends how you uh, define uh, subjective. So you find it in, uh, in ecology, you find it in uh, biology, uh, you find it in, in medicine. I'm not sure if those are uh, uh, subjective. All of them seem to have some sort of biological uh, you know, organism uh, involved. So, so they all involve, uh, uh, but you know, in some of, these, some of these cases, they're with pretty low level life, life forms. So it, it's hard to know. Um, I don't know of any good examples of it in, uh, in, in physics. But again, there are all, physics has this level of control uh, that we don't see in these other domains uh, as well. Yes, yeah. Yes. But why doesn't so? But that also has to assume that the um, placebo component is not additive with the drug component. Because if there's a placebo component and a drug component, and if the placebo component is going up, why does that take away from the component that would have otherwise been driven by the drug part? You, you need to throw in that other mechanism in order for that to explain it. And there's no obvious reason why that should be going on. Yes. Yeah, I, well, I, I certainly agree with the first part of what you're saying. I think that um, a, a big part of this involves the transparency of the uh, procedure. And uh, as I mentioned, the degradation of procedure, that whole mechanism is, is driven on the idea that there may be a whole set of things that we think are just arbitrary that are actually proving to be uh, very important. And I also think that because we now have the internet, where we have this basically sort of unlimited availability uh, for, for space and documentation, that there's an opportunity uh, to provide much more details than we could have done when we were limited by the, uh, the space of, of paper and, and journal reporting. So I think we really are in a new age with new opportunities that can really address the kind of transparency issues that you raise. Yeah, I think I think that's a real issue. Um, what happens is is that these sup when people see them described as supplemental, they uh, consider it sort of arbit or, or optional 
uh, and I, I quite agree that that's a, a big issue. And, and we need to think about this very carefully because uh, we need to make sure that in increasing uh, the amount of information that's made available that we don't make reviewing process even more onerous than, uh, than it already is. So I agree there's, a, there's a, a balancing act that has to be sorted out here. Uh, yes? Yeah, well, it, it, again, this is one of the explanations that, uh, that I suggested. It does make sense that is, uh, if, if people make uh, errors, that they're going to sort of make errors that are sort of biased towards finding results, and that as they refine uh, their uh, procedure, they're going to get rid of these errant sources of, of, of positive effects. And that certainly uh, may well be a, uh, a significant, perhaps even the entire explanation uh, for the decline effect. But you'd also affect, you'd also expect that as, uh, and this I'm sure is the case in, in many situations, that as people really understand a phenomena better and they know exactly what causes it and the conditions that are responsible for it, that they should be able to magnify the effect size. Uh, so it, it doesn't, it's not obvious why it would always work in this one direction. You had a question. No, I haven't seen that. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak to that. I'm, I'm sorry. But it's only been a couple of weeks out, so that's my excuse. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, you know, obviously, this this is you know therein lies, therein therein lies the rub, um, and there's there's no uh, simple uh, answers to that. Uh, one thing is that in many of these cases, the effect sizes shrink, but they don't shrink to nothing, uh, and so even though I would predict that. If you were to do a study looking at the, the grant proposals and the pilot data and the magnitude of the effect of the pilot data and compare that to the findings that people reported in the ultimately published studies that came from the grants, that you would consistently find that the pilot data had larger effect magnitude than the, the published studies. But nevertheless, you know, the pattern would, would have some, similar, some relevance to one another. And so pilot data, while likely to be exaggerated according to this now analysis, is uh, oftentimes, at least, not going to be uh, entirely moot. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah.
So I think it, the answer to that would be the answer to the decline effect. Uh, so um, that, I think, is sort of the $64,000 question is, is what is the explanation for the, the, the nature of the slope? Um, it seems as if uh, that the decline effect declines uh, to an asymptote that's um, typically above zero, although in the parapsychology domains it seems to go uh, uh, to zero. And, and again, that may be that there is some artifact, error variance, something like that, that's driving um, the effect combined with a real effect. And then as you keep replicating, you gradually dwindle down the uh, artifact and then get to closer to the, the, the true value. And in the case of parapsychology, the true value then leads you uh, to, uh, to zero. So that would be one, I think, um, viable explanation uh, for uh, what's uh, going on there. But I think that there are a number of other possibilities. And as I mentioned, this peculiar thing in the parapsychology literature, there actually sometimes you get this uh, uh, curvilinear effect where it actually slopes back up uh, afterwards as well. So uh, I think that you've really nailed a, a critical question that I don't have a, a, a definitive answer to. But what I think needs to be done is uh, much more careful, thoughtful, quantitative, uh, experimental in investigation of this phenomena so that we can really get a handle on exactly that question. Looks like the questions have declined. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>